Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Come Follow Me Bible Challenge. I am sharing with you the same message I shared with you last year at this time because the message of Jesus' sacrificial death and resurrection never changes. So uh, this is the same episode that played in this playlist last year, uh, but a whole year has gone by. And what do you remember of that message? Probably nothing. Wouldn't hurt you to listen again. But I do want to invite you, uh, if you're local, if you live in the Payson, Utah area, I want to invite you to come on out tomorrow night. We have a Good Friday service at 6 o'clock. It will last about an hour from 6 to about 7, where we focus on the death of Jesus Christ, uh, the crucifixion of Christ, and what that means uh, for us, those of us who have um, believed in Christ, and for those of us who have not yet believed in Christ. So, I think that would be a great opportunity for you to join us for that. And on, of course, Easter Sunday, we have our regular service here at 1045. That's the main service. We have Sunday school at 930. We'd love for you to join us for that. It's the most amazing day as far as holidays are concerned on the Christian calendar. It's the day that means everything. It's the Lord's Day of Lord's Days. It is the grandest day because we recognize this means everything. Jesus rose from the dead, and that opens the door to all of Christianity. That makes all the difference. So anyway, uh, if you're local, would love for you to join us. Orchard Hills Bible Church in Payson, Utah. You can get more information at ohbcpayson.com. And uh, I'll catch you next week. But uh, I'll go ahead before that <laughs> and play this Easter message about the work of Jesus Christ in our place for our sins, that we would be made right with God through faith alone. Well, happy Easter, Latter-day Saints. In our church, we say, He is risen, and people respond, He is risen indeed. This time of year, we especially focus on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, as we know, According to the calendar, this is the, the time in which Jesus rose again. And I'm just so excited to talk to you about Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished on our behalf that we may be saved from our sins, born again, and have eternal life. I want to read to you from Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1, the first four verses of Hebrews chapter 1. I'm just pulling it up on... Uh, my Bible software right now. Hebrews 1, 1 is where we'll be. Okay. And I'll pull it up so you can, you can follow along here. In Hebrews 1, 1, it says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification for sins, purification of sins, rather, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. Wow. There's a lot to see in this passage, but uh, let's just take each verse one by one and consider what Jesus has done. It says that at one time here in verse one, God spoke long ago to the fathers in many portions and in many ways, that there was variety in the way that God revealed himself in the past. But something has changed. It says in these last days, God has spoken to us in his son. God has spoken to us now in the person of Jesus Christ. Now that's important because we don't need to look to a variety of ways and a variety of expressions to hear from God. We just need to look to Jesus Christ to hear from God. And by God's sovereign, gracious power, he has 
given us his word and has preserved his word that we can look to it, we can read it, we can hear from God, and we can look at the ministry of Christ and his apostles and what they have left for us. We can go directly to God and hear from his son, Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome? We also see here that Jesus was appointed heir of all things. And it was through Jesus that God made the world, that God put the world together. He goes on to say that Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. And here's an amazing expression, the exact representation of his nature. You can see that this is the word character. It's uh, to have an image imprinted. That's what Jesus is to God's nature. He's the exact imprint or representation or image of God's nature. Now, what we think of sometimes with this sort of a concept is the process of copying or maybe taking a, like a stamp and making an imprint or a representation of something. But there is no mention in scripture anywhere of, of such a process of God making a copy of himself, like cloning himself or uh, duplicating or um, God producing Jesus as uh, his literal son in the same way that fathers have sons here on earth. That's not being expressed here at all. What we have is this concept of Jesus Christ being the one through whom we see the nature of God. He is the exact representation of God's nature in such a way that as we look to Jesus Christ and understand who he is and the nature of Christ, we don't have to look anywhere else to discover more about God's nature because Jesus is the exact representation of his nature. Jesus Christ is the express image of the nature of God. He's not half God, part God in any way. He is fully, truly God. And so we look to Jesus Christ and we see true deity and we understand God by understanding Jesus. And it says he upholds all things by the word of his power. <laughs> This, of course, has to be God. Who else could it be said of that he upholds all things by the word of his power? Only God. And this is being said of Jesus Christ, who is God. And it says that when Jesus made purification of sins, a cleansing, a, of course, to the Jewish mind, this harkens back to rituals that were done to cleanse people ceremonially, that they would be considered clean. When Jesus made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus, through one act, purified for himself a people by cleansing them of their sins. That's pretty amazing. People are in need of cleansing. We aren't born into this world neutral. We're not born into this world with some sort of clean slate. We are born into this world with a need for cleansing. And Jesus Christ, through his death on the cross, made purification for sins. Let me bring up another verse that I really, really like on this subject. It's 1 Peter 2.24. Talking about Jesus, it says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds, you were healed. We have been brought near to God if we have believed in the finished work of Christ in purifying our sins. That means that we have to recognize, number one, that we are sinners. We have to recognize that we have rebelled against God. We've broken his commandments. We haven't lived a perfect life. And in fact, we haven't wanted to live a perfect life. We've actually cared about ourselves more than we've cared about God, if we're being honest with ourselves. And yet, because of his great love, God, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, took on flesh and dwelt among us. He became a man and he lived 
a truly perfect life, a truly selfless life that we don't want for ourselves in our natural state. In his natural state, that's what he did. He lived a perfect life in our place, and he died the death we deserved on the cross. He bore our sins in his body on the cross. Hebrew says this is making purification of our sins. This one act is the basis for total forgiveness. Because you might look at this and say, well, really all sins? Yes, all sins, all sins, past, present, future. If you have been forgiven by God on the basis of Jesus Christ bearing your sins when he died on the cross, that means all of your sins have been washed away. You've been cleansed. You've been purified in such a way that you're not good for now, but if you mess up again later, you need to get re-purified. No. Hebrews goes on and is very clear later in the book that this sacrifice was once for all. In fact, uh, 1 Peter, I could just pull up another verse right alongside this. 1 Peter 3.18, it says, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. He died once for all the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but it made alive in the spirit. He doesn't get sacrificed over and over again. It happens once. And if you believe that he actually bore your sins so that you can be made right with God on the basis of his work, not your own, you're purified. That was the purpose. The purpose of his dying for your sins was so that you would be purified. And then after that, Hebrews 1, 3, after his death, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, how did he do that? How did he get, how did he get to the right hand of God on high? Well, he rose again. Happy Easter. That's what this is about, right? He rose again. After he made purification for sins, it says in Acts chapter 2, when Peter's preaching that it was impossible for death to hold him. And so he rose again and he ascended into heaven and sat down. Now that's important. You don't want to just pass over the fact that he sat down. Because when does somebody sit? It's when the work is finished. So just the, the act of him sitting down is evidence that his work to pay for our sins was enough to truly pay the price that we deserve to, to finish the work, to cause us to be cleansed. He doesn't need to get back up and cleanse us again. He's not standing up to keep doing his tasks. And again, Hebrews talks about this more in chapters eight, nine, and 10, but instead he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Isn't that amazing? Having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. He is better than the angels. He is more glorious than the angels of God. He is, in fact, the one true God of the universe, Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? That's the gospel message that I want you to know and understand and believe this Easter, that you can be forgiven of the sins that deserve the wrath of God if you believe in Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 5, it says, We are saved from the wrath of God by the death of Christ. You deserve the wrath of God because of your sin. But you can be totally set free, purified, and cleansed in a moment, in an instant, once, once for all, if you believe in the finished work of Christ, who lived a perfect life, died the death that you deserve, rose again and is seated at the right hand of God, always watching over, protecting, caring for his people, those who believe in his name. Are you one of them? I want you to be. Would you trust in Christ alone? Not trusting in your own works to save you at all, not trusting in your own righteousness at all, 
but totally, absolutely relying on the finished work of Christ, would you believe in that today? In that sense, if you do, you will have a truly happy Easter. And it won't be Easter so much to you anymore. It'll be Resurrection Day. Will you have a happy Resurrection Day this year? I hope you will. God bless.